I heard, I heard, okay? You know, our, our church is good. I heard, I heard, okay? You know, our, our church is good with giving food out. You know, like they said they plan an epic barbecue. Like when, I, when they told me epic, they don't use the word epic. When they said epic barbecue, I'm imagining even like greater things now. Back then it was just like, you know, hot dogs. But now it's everything, okay? So they said they will, they will give us an epic barbecue if we make it to the finals, okay? So I don't know. Is that possible? Is that possible for us to make it to the finals? Yeah? Yeah, come on. What's the love? Is it possible? Yeah. We're going to make it to the finals, okay? So they're going to plan an epic barbecue for us. It's going to be great. Uh, starting, starting, so much, right? Starting, we just got to take those two guys out. Don't let them play tomorrow. Uh, starting this, this coming Saturday, Sunday, and then, um, uh, oh yeah, okay. So that, that's going on, big VAY tournament thing going on. And then VAY t-shirts. We have our t-shirts, they're really cool. Okay, yeah. VAY t-shirts, t-shirts are $10 if you guys want to buy it. And tank tops are twelve dollars twelve dollars okay they're they're wonderful they're beautiful we're printing them out right now if you guys want one of those ten dollars twelve dollars and uh go and find t t will tell you uh she'll she'll take names down and she will get you guys your shirt ten dollars for a t-shirt twelve dollars for a tank top okay great deal it's a great deal okay uh okay next announcement next announcement is we got our retreat coming up august 30th to September 2nd. August 30th to September 2nd is our Young Adult College Retreat. We're going up to Bandito Campgrounds. Uh, it's going to be great. Who keeps saying that? <laughs> I keep hearing this like, yay! Yeah. All right, Bandito Campgrounds. It's going to be fun. It's a, it's a camping trip. Um, uh, so come out. Come out to that. It, it, we said 50? 50? What's my other use? 50? 50. We said $50. It's going to be $50, which is super cheap, right? Super cheap for the amount of crazy food we get to eat up there, okay? Like, you know, I've never had hotel at a campsite before, but we had that last year. I was blown away. I can't imagine what we're going to have this year, but, you know, it's probably going to be just as good. So um, come out. It's a great way to end the summer and start a whole new year uh, on a high note. So Bandito, August 30th, September 2nd, keep your dates open. Start signing up. Facebook will be uh, a Facebook thingy group page party. I don't know. Invite is going to happen, and just invite yourself, and then pay the 50 bucks, and then you, we'll, we'll have you there, okay? Uh, anything else? I think that's it, right? I think that's, that's all the announcements we have. Fantastic. All right, let's bow our heads. Let's, uh, let's, let's get this party going. Uh, if, you guys, if you guys like, you guys can put your hands out as a posture of receiving. Uh, Father, I want to I thank you so much, Lord, for the work that you are doing in our church and in our people. But I pray continuously and constantly that, God, that you will begin to just rapture us with your love. That, Father, you will just encompass us with your, your glory and your, your holiness. That our lives would be so transformed, so transfixed upon you. That we can't live a day, Father God, um, like the days we lived yesterday. That we will live, Father God, forever changed in your sight. And so, Father, I pray for that today as we learn about marriage. As we learn about the beauty of marriage and the transformation that comes, takes place through marriage, God, would you begin to convict and strengthen our, our community to desire such a love, desire such a connection and such a beauty. We love you so much, Father God, and we thank you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, one, of the, one, of the, one of the crazy stories I had for Arizona, we're going to have an Arizona debriefing for you guys in two weeks. We're going to come up here, and people are going to share about what happened there. There's going to be a lot of cool stories, but um, I'll show you guys one story. One story that really touched my heart, I, I'm, I'm going to try to uh, connect it to uh, our message today, was uh, we're in Arizona, and I'm in charge of the youth team, right? The youth team, which basically is composed of guys like you guys, your age, and we go out and we, we, sh we find youth and we kind of just share, we hang out, we, we, we spend some time with them, we do ministry with them. And one of the youth ministry things that we did was we did this Canyon de Shea hike with them, which is this, this really long one mile down hike and one mile up hike that we do. It's in this beautiful valley, it's in this beautiful canyon that's, that's for their people, their ancestral people, they're there. And this place is a very spiritual place for them. So when we were there, when we were down there, you know, we did a lot of great ministry stuff. And when we came back up, um, usually what we have to do is we have to drive them back home first. 
because we were limited in, uh, on cars and stuff like that. We took one 15-passenger van and two small minivans, right? And so we took one 15-passenger van and we drove them all the way back to uh, their, their reservation, the their areas where they're living, and we had the whole team stuck in this canyon area uh, because we just waiting for them to come back so we can drive them back home. All right, boy, who are you? Why are you yelling? All right, yeah, okay. So, so we're, we're standing there. We're waiting for this, the vans to come back so that we can um, drive home together, back to our campsite together, back to our, our base camp together. And, you know, it was really hot that day. It was really sunny. It was really pouring. It, it was really sunny. So you know, people were sweating. Water was running out. And, you know, we're just thinking, wouldn't it be nice if it rained? You know, wouldn't it be nice if it rained? And then it started trickling down. Right? It's like, oh, this is cute. You know, it's raining. You know, a little dropping here and there. And then all of a sudden, it was like a monsoon. It just fell on us. It, we were just drenched from head to toe, you know? And everyone was trying to r- find shelter, but there was nowhere else. We were on top of the canyon, so it was just p- constant water pouring on us. We had two vans that fit 14 people. We had 29 people there. And then everyone was trying to sh- shove themselves into these vans underneath the, the hoods and stuff like that, trying to f- find some sort of shelter and cover. And I was thinking to myself, I was thinking, you know, uh, I, was, I was the main leader there, so I was thinking, you know, we, we got to do something because it's, it's pouring and we don't know when it's going to stop. So I was thinking, I'm going to call the boys and we're just going to take the rain and let the girls drive home, right? And for, when I was thinking about that, I was like, I don't know if the boys are going to be down with that because, you know, <laughs> they're going to be in the van. I don't want to hear all these whining and complaining with me. But so I just got up to those two vans and I said, boys, throw it inside, I said, get out, right? And without question, without question, without whining, without complaining, they all just ran out. All the boys, they all just got out of the car. Right? And I said, I, I told a few of the leaders, hey, you guys drive the girls home. And so as the two vans were driving home, 15 of the boys were just standing there waving as the, as, <laughs> as the water was just pouring on, down on us, you know. And I was thinking at that moment, I was praying before the Lord, I was thinking, you know, wouldn't it be amazing if God's people learned to have this heart of sacrifice, right? To, to be able to sacrifice for each other, to be able to give themselves for one another, without receiving back, right? willing to take the hit so that our, our, our other people can receive the pleasure and the glory. Right? And that's one of the things that I love about Arizona Missions. That's one of the things they teach through character development through, for the brothers is this idea of selfless, sacrificial love that they give. Right? And of course, the, the bros, you know, they, they were running around, they didn't know what to do, trying to find shelter, and they ran down to this cave where they did some stuff that I'm not allowed to talk about. But, you know, like, uh, <laughs> but, but it, was, it was good, right? It was good. And, you know, today we're talking about marriage. We're talking about marriage today and how sex and marriage is uh, connected. But a lot of you guys, you're thinking, I'm not married yet, so I don't really want to talk about marriage. It sounds kind, of, kind, of, kind of weird. But honestly, what we're trying to be, well, to prepare you for marriage is actually to cultivate this heart of selflessness. Because that, if you can cultivate this heart of selflessness, sacrificial love, then you are ready for marriage, right? And you, and you have a glimpse of what it means to be in this place where you can be married, okay? And so that's, that's what we're going to be trying to, I'm going to try to convict you guys with and try to inspire you guys to, 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 to draw from, is to have this heart of sacrifice. Brothers, sisters, sacrificing for, the, for each other. You know, one of the main things we learned in, on, on the trip as well is because, you know, they're all military guys who, who led the thing. So one of the things they always learn about sacrificing is, you know, you let the girls eat first, youngest to oldest, and you let the boys, youngest to oldest, eat first. And the reason why we, we do that is not because, you know, we're, um, uh, we're not feminists and, we, you know, we're all, you know, doing this. Stuff. But we, the reason why we do that is because if food runs out, and food sometimes does run out, if food runs out, by the time, you know, all that happens and you only got the male leaders left, male guys left, then it's okay because hopefully the guys are spiritually mature enough to say, it's okay. One meal is not going to kill me as long as my younger brothers and sisters have a meal, right? We can take it so that they can enjoy. And it's part of this idea of selfless, sacrificial attitude. And that's the same attitude we need to cultivate if we want to think about marriage. We want to think about giving your life over to someone else. Okay, so open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Okay, uh, we're going to see how sex is actually a part of cultivating this. Okay, in the, peop- uh, in, in, in the city of Corinth, we talked about how the city is just prom- promiscuously known for sexual activities. You know, if you're, if you're, a Corinth, if you're from Corinth, you're, you're given a verb, you're a Corinthianizer, meaning you sleep with everything that moves, right? So it's a very prolifically promiscuous culture. And because of that, 
Christians stand out like a sore thumb, right? And in the church, they begin to be divided in the way they deal and think about sex. One group we talked about two weeks ago was a group that said, you know what, everything is good for me because I'm a Christian. I'm free to do anything I want. You know, everything is permissible, right? And the other group that was divided said, you know, no, no, sex is bad. Sex is ill. We should deprive each other of sex. We should only come together for making babies with sex. That's about it, you know, That's because sex is just ugly, right? And last week, Paul's saying both of your views are wrong. Both of your views of sex is actually wrong, okay? This view over here where everything is permissible for me, I can sleep and do whatever I want, Paul's saying, no, that's not right. The reason why is when, when you engage in sexual activity, intimacy, Christian view of sex is what? You become one with that person. It's not like two people, you know, Siamese twins sticking together, but you're literally becoming one person, one individual. Everything becomes united together as one. Now, if you are outside the realm of marriage, right, marriage is basically everything that is mine is yours. You are physically committing what your spirit has already spiritually created. Okay? Marriage is physically committing what your body has already spiritually created, this oneness. But if you are in, engaging in intimacy in sex without this commitment, what happens is, Paul said, you're, you're splitting body and soul apart. You're ripping your bodies apart. You, you, you guys don't understand, but you're, 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 you're creating brokenness. That's why I always say, like, you know, if you want to hurt someone, if you want to really hurt someone, right, the best thing you can do for them is sleep with them, right? That's the best way to hurt someone because you know. You know of the, the walls that begin to be put up because of intimacy. You know the hardness that comes out of it, the untrusting attitude, right? The, the, the stubbornness that comes out of it, or even the opposite way, the constant, like, pursuing of it, giving yourself over and over and over into it. It breaks you. It destroys you, right? And Paul's saying, just as bad food is bad for the body, is damaging to the body, so is bad sex is also damaging to the body, right? And bad sex is anything that is, married, uh, that is sex outside of marriage between a man and a woman, right? But today, Paul's going to address on this other side. This other group was like, you know, we live in such a horrible, horrible sexual culture. You know what? We don't think sex is good at all. It's actually ill. So we um, deprive each other of sex only come together from, for baby making and then kind of stop from that. And Paul said, no, that's not good either. Don't deprive yourself actually of it because why? Your body constantly, you're made to, 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 to enjoy it and to desire it. And if you do that, you deprive yourself of it, you, you end up shooting your desires somewhere else and you actually um, fall apart. You actually create you know, adultery and uh, sexual morality that comes out of that. So, Paul, so look at the chapter 7 verse 1 for me. I'll read that for you guys. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Now for the matters you wrote about, it is, a, it is good for a man not to marry. But since there is so much immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. The husband should fulfill his marital duties to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife's body does not belong to her alone, but also to her husband. In the same way, the husband's body does not belong to him alone, but also to his wife. Do not deprive each other except by mutual consent and for a time so that you may devote yourself to prayer. Then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I say this as a concession, not as a command. I wish that all men were as I am, but each man has his own gift from God. One has this gift, another has that gift. You know, Paul sounds like, you know, he wants us to be single, but I'll tell you next week about why he was pushing for singleness in this, uh, in this city, right? Uh, but today, t what he's saying is this. Your idea of depriving each other from sex, that's not, that's not the right picture either. You shouldn't deprive each other from that. Because sex has this beautiful way of creating intimacy, right? And, it, and it's about giving yourself to someone else. It's about learning to be sacrificial. So before I, I engage in why, how sex does that, I, want, I need to give you guys information about the essence of marriage first. Okay? What is the essence of marriage? Essence of marriage. There's two types of marriage that people come, uh, come into. One is a consumer mentality. The other is a covenant mentality. A consumer mentality is this. It's like going to a supermarket. This supermarket is providing me with the best deals, the best uh, pro produce. Everything is working well for me. So I actually want to go to the supermarket. I'll continue to go to the supermarket until this other supermarket gives me a better deal. 
See, if this other supermarket gives me a better deal, then I'm no longer going to that supermarket. I'm going to go to this supermarket. It's a consumer mentality. Same way, when people engage in a relationship outside, outside of this covenant idea of marriage, when you engage in a, a marriage outside that idea of it, you know what happens? You never know what's going to happen with your relationship. You never know. Because you're thinking, this person can leave me at any time. They have no obligation to me. At any moment when he or she does not feel like I have given them enough yet, or my produce to them, or my deals to them aren't fulfilling satisfactory to them, then they can just walk away and go somewhere else. Right? That's a consumer mentality of relationship marriage. But the Christian view of marriage is a, is a covenant. Covenant marriage. Covenant means promise. Right? It's a promise-initiated marriage. The covenant marriage goes something like this. It, it means that no matter what, no matter what, when we take our vows, thick or thin, uh, sickness and health, till death do us part, no matter what comes our way, we will be together. Right? We will be together. It's, it's kind of like you and a, a, a parent and a child. The parent can't just abandon the child whenever he or she wants because it's not working out for them. They can't just say, oh, forget it. I'm done with that. Right? They have to raise that child. They have to continue to raise that child. They are legally binded to raise that child. Right? In our culture today, we have this kind of thing. You know, I don't need to get married. Why do I need, why do I need a piece of paper to define my love? Right? Why do I need a legal document to define you know, my relationship with this person? Why can't I just love them? Okay? It's true. You're right. If you love them that way, you're engaging in a consumer mentality. Because why? At any moment, you can walk away. But if you engage in a promised relationship, if you see it in the Christian viewpoint of a covenant marriage, that means this, you are bounded to this person. You are bounded to them physically, emotionally, spiritually for the rest of your life. You cannot break it. A promise is forever. I understand that there are, there are a lot of Christian marriages that gets divorced and broken like that. And you know, honestly with that, my heart is this, you know, somewhere down the line, either their pastor didn't teach it to them, right, or they didn't grow up with that same heart mentality, understanding that marriage is a covenant rather than a, cons- uh, a consumer mentality. They've engaged in their marriage, even though under the guise of Christianity, in a consumer mentality, because the moment when their f- personal needs are no longer met, they bone out. They leave, right? And Paul is saying this, the essence of marriage in the Christian viewpoint, the essence of marriage is this. I am with you till death do us part. No matter what, I am with you. Okay? And what, why is that so important? Because in a covenant marriage versus a consumer marriage, in a covenant marriage, if you engage that way, it always provides deeper intimacy. It always provides deeper intimacy. Do you understand that? Like, if you know that this person will not leave you, no matter what you share with them, no matter how dark, and dirty and evil your secret inside is, and we all have them, we all have our dark secrets, we all have our our dirtiness behind us, that we share with this covenant person with us, this person who we made a promise to never leave, we know that what? They're going to be hurt, of course. They're going to be jaded by it, of course. But in the end, what? They will be with me. And I'm, I'm able to share and be vulnerable continually with this person. And over time, we build a deeper intimacy Ra- rather, in a consumer relationship, what happens? You're afraid to share. You know you are. You're not going to give them everything you have because you know that what happens? They have the chance to break you. They have a chance to destroy your heart because the moment, the moment they no longer feel like you are part of them, they'll bone out. And what did they do? They took their intimacy. You, they took your vulnerability with them. Instead of cherishing it and protecting it, they destroyed it. Right? And you lose all trust again. See, a covenant marriage, a marriage that's based on a promise, creates intimacy, creates longingness, it creates vulnerability towards one another. A covenant marriage also creates stability. Stability. That means no matter what happens, you know you're going to be stable through the whole process. Right? Things are going to come up in your marriage. No marriage is perfect. It's not like Disney. You end it beautifully. I love Shrek. I forgot which Shrek it was, where you know, the next film, it was just him going through his daily life, and you realize, man, this sucks. And you ask Rumpelstiltskin you know, to change his life up a little bit, and you realize you know, mar- stability in marriage is actually very beautiful. Actually, I like that one. That was a good one, because that was the only Disney one that actually told the truth about 
marriage after, after the, you know, the, the kiss and stuff like that. But the majority of the time, we think that after we get married and things are yay and it's going to be yay forever. It's not true. It's not true. And, there's no st- and, 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 and then unless you are tied, unless you have that covenant promise to stable you, right, you won't be able to make it through those rough patches. You know, there's a, there's a story of Odysseus or Ulysses, depending on which, which version you read, right, where his, he took his ship past the siren island. Our sirens are people that, these girls, they sing to lure men into this trap to kill them, right? And Odysseus, he knew this. And so what did he do? He wrapped himself, he tied himself to the mast of his ship. And he says, no matter what I scream, no matter what I say, right? Keep me here. Do not cut me away. We have to get through this or else we're going to die. And so they, his men tied him there and he tied, they tied himself. And as he was going through, the sirens were singing, they were luring him in, and he was like, please cut me away. You know, I want to. I command you as your captain, do it or I'm going to kill you. And the men were like, no, you told us not to. Right? You told us not to. And eventually what happens, the ship passed the island, and they were set free. See, the marriage covenant provides that stability. It provides that mass that you anchor yourself to. So no matter what difficult times you go past, what happens? You will go through it together. But in a, in a, in a consumer marriage, in a consumer relationship, what happened? The moment difficulty happens, the moment when one individual no longer feels he is getting or she is getting the right product, the right uh, uh, incentive, he will say, forget it. I'm jumping off the ship. I don't have to be in this relationship anymore. It's too difficult. It's too crazy. I'm gone. And they bounce. You see, the essence of marriage and the covenant marriage is this, right? You make a promise and it provides intimacy it provides stability, okay, forever. And if you engage from a Christian viewpoint of marriage, you have this ability to create this closeness with your, with your individual person without being scared. You actually can become deeper as one rather than just, you know, sexually intimate, but emotionally and everything else separate. That's why when I went to Arizona, a lot of these young girls, like 13, 14, they got tattoos all over their bodies. It's because, you know, that's the only way that they feel they're in control, okay? They're the only way they feel in control because the majority of their life, they grew up without their dads. You know, they're these guys who technically, they're not even married. Their fathers and mothers aren't even married. These guys, they come, they sleep with their mothers, have them, and the guys kind of bounce off. They're alcoholics. They move away. They don't really see their fathers often, right? And, and their life is just in a shamble and a mess. They barely have enough. Some of these girls live in, like, uh, trailers without electricity and running water and the only thing that they can feel like they're in control is that they get tattoos you know it's like here at least i can feel the pain i'm in control of my life and they always get tattoos of their own names so i always tease them like you know are you going to forget your name why are you why are you tattooing your name on your body for it they're like no and they're, they're joking about it and they asked me this question they asked me you know tony if you can get a tattoo right what would you get you know if you would get a tattoo i said probably my wife's name and they're like what no that's crazy I said, why? I said, what if she leaves you? Right? I said, she, she won't. But, no, but what if she does? I said, she won't. I said, but you don't know that. I said, no, I do. I said, why? How do you know that? Right? Because me and my wife, we're, we are engaged in a covenant marriage where it's not about me and her trying to fulfill our individual needs. It's us together fulfilling a promise that we've made. Right? To death do us part as when that will happen. So I'm not afraid of getting a tattoo of my wife's name on my body because I know that I'm not going to leave her. Right? Because it's a promise. We've made a promise. And they were like, oh, that's crazy Christian talk, you know? Who does that kind of stuff? I'm like, there, there are people out there who stay together. You have to trust. You have to believe that, you know? And because they've grown up in such a broken environment that the idea of this interconnected relationship doesn't even kind of register to them. You know? And as part of our witness, our witness is to be that kind of light for them, to be that, that, that rem- remembrance that, yeah, there is a possibility of deep love that lasts a long time, right? So the essence of marriage, before we get into sex, the essence of marriage, right, is not about consumer relationship, which I think a lot of us, we go into. I think we do. A lot of us, we come into a relationship, we're consumer-based, we're, con- we're consumer-based because, because all we really want is our individual needs fulfilled. And once that's fulfilled, and, you know, we'll, 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 we'll continue to stay in that relationship. We'll continue to enjoy that relationship until that person no longer gives us that thing. And then we're thinking about bouncing. We're thinking in our mind, oh, when's the best time so I can get out of here? You know, because I'm no longer feeling, feeling it anymore. I'm no, longer, I'm no longer getting it anymore. So we, we can bounce. We have that idea. But what Paul is trying to teach us and what the church is trying to teach and what 
Christ is trying to reveal to us through marriage is that marriage has this ability, covenant marriage has this ability to create stability, it has this ability to create intimacy, vulnerability in a person, in a relationship that you can't find anywhere else, that you cannot get anywhere else unless you have that intimate promise for one another to be vulnerable to each other. Even some of you guys in a relationship right now, I guarantee you, you're probably not vulnerable to each other. You know, you are, you're probably not. You know why? Because you're thinking any moment this guy can bounce. I don't know. Or any moment this girl can bounce. I always register guys. I'm sorry, because I'm just, I'm just a guy, okay? Um, the last thing, covenant, covenant marriage creates character change. It changes your character. Because why? You're no longer an individual in marriage. You become one person. And you, everything that's you becomes this other person. And that changes you. That changes you spiritually, emotionally, mentally. You're not living for yourself, but you're living for each other. Now, I have people always ask me this question. You know, Pastor, you, you've, you've been, you're married to your wife two years. You've dated her for 13 years, right? When you kiss her, does it still feel the same way when you kissed her in 1999 at prom? As, do, you, do you still get that electricity feeling? And I was like, no. <laughs> and they're like, oh, see, that's what I don't... Why, why is that? You know, why... Why, why, why would you continue that relationship when you don't get that, that same passion anymore? I'm like, you know, honestly, that, that initial electricity feeling that you get, that like, whoa, you know, it's a very egotistical feeling. You know that, right? It's a very egotistical feeling. You're thinking, dude, she likes me, right? Dude, she's holding my hand, right? Dude, it feels good for me. It's very shallow, but it feels great. It's really loud. It's really passionate, but it's very shallow, right? Nowadays, when I kiss my wife, it's not that kind of like shocking feeling, but what it is is this deep, intimate knowledge, right? That she's not in it for her, but she's in it for me. That I'm not in it for me, but I'm in it for her. See, I'd rather have a, a lake that's quiet but deep rather than a babbling brook that's loud and shallow. Because a babbling brook that's loud and shallow, what happens? It's going to dry up. It will dry up. See, covenant marriage, what it does is it creates a change in the person you're with. It creates a change in them. Because you're not thinking about my individual needs. You're thinking about the other's needs. And it, over time, what happens? That person, you become selfless towards each other. You become sacrificial towards each other. Rather than thinking, you're not giving me what I want. Forget you. I'm leaving. I'm leaving too. You're not rejecting each other. You are embracing each other. Because you're not coming at it from a consumer point of view, you're coming at it from a promise point of view. Okay? So how does sex, how does sex engage us in this covenant promise? How does sex engage God's people in the covenant, prom, in the covenant promise? Okay? Paul is telling the people, don't deprive each other of sexual intimacy. Don't. If you are married, do not deprive each other of sexual intimacy. Because they thought to themselves, yeah, we're really holy. We're holy because we're not being like the rest of the world who's just sleeping with everything that breathes. We're just sleeping when we're being intimate only when we want to have babies. So that's a good thing. Paul's saying, no, don't, don't deprive each other of the deep intimacy of sex because what is sex? Right? What is sex in marriage? Sex in marriage is this. It's the renewal of that covenant marriage that you continue to have. Right? You know how people have this renewal of their vows every 50 years or 20 years or whatever? Sex, sexual intimacy, the pleasure that comes out of it, the beauty that comes out of it, it's a constant covenant reminder that every time I'm engaging in this intimacy with my wife or my husband, we are one. It renews that promise. Maybe we've been separate for a long time, you know, for, for a few days or a, a few weeks, and we, have it, we kind of feel like kind of distant from each other. But when we come together, we engage in the intimacy of sexual relationships. What happens in marriage? We're reminded, yes, this person and me, we're together as one. It renews that. And, 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 and what, what gives you that constant desire is that pleasure that comes out of it. The pleasure is good that comes out of it. It's not meant to be thought of as disgusting or ugly. See, church has a bad rep for this. People think that people in church are very kind of like, eh, towards sex. No, it's not true, okay? Sex is a very intimate thing, very beautiful thing that's, that's created for us to continually renew our promise towards each other. Don't you guys feel like whenever you, oh, guys, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not assuming, right? I'm not assuming, but you know, when, when you engage in sexual intimacy, the first thing you want to cry out is like, I love you. I want to be with you forever. Everything about me, I want you to have. It just comes out naturally because why? That's what sex was created for. 
In this beauty of marriage, you just connect yourself to each other. You see, so when Paul is saying don't deprive each other of sex, he's not saying sex is bad. Paul is saying use sex as a way of renewing this intimate covenant promise that you guys constantly have daily, weekly, monthly, yearly. Don't give up on that. Don't deprive each other of that. Engage in that. It brings that connection back all the time. Right? And secondly, most people think, oh, sex is a private matter, Pastor Tony. It's really private. It's really about me. It shouldn't be about the other person. No, no, you're wrong. You're wrong. Sex, in, its, in the context of marriage, it's, it's a gift for the other person. It's not a gift. It's not for you. It's the one gift that you can personally give to the other person. It's the only gift that you can give to the other person. Right? When you don't make it about yourself, but you make it totally about them. A lot of times when, you know, when young ladies, when, when you guys think about, you know, I want to maybe have this mentality. Maybe I want to uh, stay, stay a virgin until I'm married. Right? And then some guys comes up to you and they say, you know, really, I want to engage in this intimacy with you. Right? And you're like, at first you're kinda, you kind of you kind of shy away from it because you're thinking, this is very important to me. This is a very big thing for me. Right? Because it's the one gift that you can do. And when you give that gift, for girls, when you give that gift to them, right, you're literally, what are you doing? You're literally giving it to them. Right? It's the one gift that you have that you can offer to them. But guys, sometimes, you know, in our shallowness, in our, in our big-headedness, in our own, like, self-perversionness, we take that. Not as a way of saying, you know, I want to give something back to you. We take that as a self, selfish fulfillment for ourselves. And we offer you a sense of love to make you feel like you've, you've been connected. But really, the reality of it, it's really for us. And see, Paul is, say, Paul is trying to engage uh, sexual intimacy in this way, where you're giving it to each other. It's the one gift that you can give to the other person. I know this kind of, it's kind of hard to swallow for a lot of you guys because the majority of our, us in our, in, in, our, um, in our context now, majority of us have, have engaged in sexual uh, intimacy before we're married. Right? In the 1900s, like 93% of the women were virgins when they got married. In 1940s, it dropped down to 43. In the past, 2000, the past decade, it's down to 15, right? 15% are actually virgins when they're married. The other ones have engaged in this already continual sexual relationship. And the problem that comes out of that is what? Right? Aren't you more broken when you engage in that? Aren't you, don't, don't you come out more closed to yourself? Don't you feel like you can't really share yourself to this other person yet? Because you don't really know that you really can trust them? Right? You don't know that you can give yourself to them because your mentality has always been because of the culture, this individual culture we live in, you're thinking they can bone out any time. Paul is teaching marriage. It's not about boning out. Covenant marriage is you stick to each other forever. And sex in that marriage creates this deep intimacy for one another. Sex in that marriage creates this deep renewal promise towards each other. It's always that promise. You're renewing that over and over. And it's a gift that you give for the other person, not you take from the other person. So how can I do something for you, right? How can I give this to you? That's what it is. And that's the hard part here, right? You can't do that unless you have practiced and cultivated a heart of sacrifice. You understand that? Brothers, you cannot, you cannot engage in that type of relationship unless you engage, or you cultivate your heart to a heart that is selfless. That when you engage in intimacy, you're not demanding from your girl. You're actually trying to give to her. Right? You're giving yourself. You're not taking from her. You're giving to her. Same thing, ladies. When you're engaging in a relationship that you've been jaded by a long time, you're not trying to take from them whatever they can offer you now, and hopefully they won't leave, but you are actually trying to give your heart to them. But that won't be created unless, unless we cultivate a heart of selfless sacrifice. And it's a big thing. It's a hard thing, right? Because why? In marriage, in a marriage, there will come a point, I promise you, in a relationship, there will come a point where either the husband or the wife will withdraw from, the, from you. They will withdraw. Either because someone passed away, they're sick, someone in the family is sick, something's going on in them that is causing them to just, it's all about me right now. I want to make it about me right now, 
right? Now, in a relationship, right, in a, in a consumer relationship, what do you do? You will say, okay, I'll give you as much as I can, but after I run out, since you've been rejecting everything I've given you, guess what? I'm going to start rejecting you, right? You keep rejecting me, I'll keep rejecting you. And you think that's justice. That's not justice. You know what that is? That's revenge, right? You're not giving me what I want? Fine, I'm not giving you what you want. That's fair. No, it's not fair. That's revenge. You're taking out revenge on this person. Right? In the relationship, there will come a time when one person will be self-absorbed to themselves. Right? And unless you have what I call love philanthropy, you will never be able to get out of that. Love philanthropy, you know, uh, being a philanthropist is this. A philanthropist is a person who gives money to the poor and to organizations because why? He or she is very rich. They have a huge amount of income coming in, so they're able to give it out, right? Love philanthropy is the same way. When your spouse, when your significant other is pulling away, rejecting everything that you're giving to them, right? Constantly rejecting you, constantly saying, it's all about me. Give, give, give to me. And you're thinking, I'm tired of this. If you don't have a source of love that's coming into you, guess what? You're going to run out and you're going to break apart, right? Because you've engaged not in a promise relationship, not in a covenant relationship. You engage in a consumer relationship. I've given you the best I can. I've been as selfless as I can, but you know what? You're not working it for me anymore, so we're done. But a person who has love philanthropy, someone who is being filled with love himself or herself, is constantly being able to give even though they're being rejected. Give and give and give. And the only way that you as, as believers, that's why covenant marriage is so important, the only way as believers we can engage in that is that we have a greater source of love flowing through us. And the greater source of love is always through the gospel. It's always through the gospel because what do we, what do we have to con- constantly remember? That Christ himself stepped into the void. He took off the robe of divinity he poured on the flesh, uh, the, the flesh of humanity, and he went out and he pursued us. He pursued us when we rejected him. He pursued us even more when we rejected him. And he said, I will keep pursuing you no matter what it takes to redeem you. Because even if it takes me my life, I will do it. Because that's what I do. I am a giving God. I will pursue you to the end. And when we have a love like that pouring into us, guess what? We can begin to pursue our significant other to the end. No matter how much you draw away from me, I will not take your rejection. I will not let your rejection turn to revenge. I will take your rejection and I will continue to pursue you. I will continue to pursue you until I've won you over. But we cannot do that. There's not that love flowing through us. It's impossible, you guys. You can try with your strength as much as you can, but in the end, you will drain out. You will fall apart and you will just be broken. That's why a lot of, a lot of um, families, you know, father and mother, they give all their love to their children, pour it all onto them, and then eventually what happens, they don't connect with each other. And eventually when all their kids go off to college, they look at each other as two total, total strangers. Who are you? I don't know. Who are you? What should we do now? I don't know. Right, what do we usually do? Take care of the kids. We're not here anymore. Well, I guess we're just going to go our separate ways. See, that's what usually happens. Right? Think about this. If you constantly pursue this deep love with someone, if you constantly pursue, you don't become less loving. Do you understand that? You actually become more loving. I'll give you an example. When a parent pursue a child, when you're young, what does the child do for the... Sometimes the parent look at the child like, dang it, right? You're a pain. You're a pain. But I'll keep pouring love into you. I'll keep feeding you. I'll keep giving you a bed to sleep in. But you're a pain sometimes. They they don't feel love towards this child all the time, but they will continue to pour into this child, giving them what they need, providing for them. Because then eventually what happens? The love for that child becomes so deep. Becomes so deep. That's why even the child, when he turns 20, and he's a total douchebag, the mother will still love him, right? Mother will still love this child. You're like, how can the mother love this boy? He's like a total douche. Like, I don't know. But she spent so majority of her life pouring into him when he did not give anything back to her. But when you begin to pour something like that, you get deeper in your love. You don't become more hateful. You become more loving. You become more loving. Right? At the end of the story, um, 
In Arizona, one of the, the hardest things to do is to reach out to the youth because they've grown up so broken, they've grown up so withdrawn from people that they don't trust anyone. So anyone comes to them who wants to get to know them, they're just thinking that they're trying to get something out of them, right? So they, they, have, that, they have these walls, and there's very thick walls that's built up. And, you know, our job as a youth team is to go out and try to, you know, get into them, engage them in these walls, break down these walls slowly. And it's hard. It is difficult. You know, I don't know if you guys have been rejected, but my job, my job is to tell them, with how, no matter how much they reject, you continue to engage with them. And these kids, you know, my, my team was just constantly, constantly rejected over and o- over. They asked like a thousand questions. They get one word responses. These kids they didn't want to open up to them. And so there's one girl from my team. She came up to me after like the fifth day. And she was just crying. She said, Pastor Tony, I, I can't take it anymore. It's just too much, right? This is too much work. Can you, can you just give me another person to work with? Someone easier? Right? This girl, you know, she just won't open up. She just won't want my attention, my, my love. She keeps rejecting it. And I said, no, I'm not going to give you someone else. Right? I want you to do this. Okay? I, want you to, I want you to go find some dark corner somewhere. I want you to pray. I want you to meditate. Not upon how you feel right now, how rejected you feel. I want you to pray about this. Meditate on the cross. Meditate upon the, the work of Christ in your life. Right? And how much he took to pursue you. Meditate on that. Tomorrow morning, I want you to take that and pursue this, the girl the same way. Okay? And so, you know, she said, okay. She, she went and she did that. And the next few days, she, she constantly did her best to pursue. Constantly being rejected. Over and over being rejected. Up until the very last day. You know, up until the very last service. Finally, I don't know what happened. You know, this constant pursuing. Finally, we had this prayer time. And... My team member, she just put her hands on this girl, and she started weeping for this girl, just crying for her. And she didn't know where it came from, but she was just crying for her. And at that very moment, this girl, all the walls just broke down. We just saw her just sobbing and heaving and crying. And then my, my teammate took her out, and they were just talking, and she was just sharing about all the damage that's been done in her life, all the abuse, all the hurts. And, you know, my team just said, you know what, I want you to know something, I love you. I want you to know something, I love you. And the girl said, you know, I don't believe it, I love you. She said, I don't know if it's possible. She said, I love you. You got to hold on to that. I love you, right? Christ loves you. I love you. We love you. And the girl was just heaving and sobbing. She said, can a love like that be real? It's like, why would you continue to pursue nonstop? And she said, because I've been pursued. I've been pursued nonstop. And I give this to you. And it was just a, it was just a very amazing God breakthrough, a very deep connection that happened. That's what happens in covenant marriage, you guys. That's what happens when covenant marriage happens. You're not, you're not in this relationship thinking that they're going to leave you at any moment. You're in this relationship thinking, I'm going to be with this person forever. It creates stability. It creates intimacy. It creates a change of heart. And when we engage in sex, it's not a sex for my own personal pleasure now. It's sex for what? For the giving to the other person. That sex becomes a renewal of that covenant, always to that person. Every time we engage in intimacy, we're remembering what? You and me, we're one. We're not separate. We're not two individuals. We're one. We're creating spiritually what our bodies is already doing physically. We're becoming one. Right? And he says, you can't do this unless why? Because some marriages, you can do this, right? Some marriages, you can, you can try that. But the majority of the time, when someone withdraws from you, you kind of walk away. Unless you have a deep love that's flowing in through you to the other person. Unless there's that deep love coming in, flowing out. Right? I know for a lot of you brothers, you're thinking, that's hard, man. You know, because really when I look at her, I think she's hot. Right? She, I, I like her because she's hot. You know? And so is hell. But that doesn't mean you should go for it, you know? You know? And, and you ladies, same thing. When you, you engage in this relationship, you're thinking, I'm going to give my heart to this guy and give him everything, but you're not really sure if he's really going to stick around. You're hoping he will. You're, you're praying that he will, but there's no promise in that. I have a lot of sisters come up to me and say, Tony, I, he loves me, but he doesn't want to marry me. So I, I tell him, you know, he probably doesn't love you as much as he thinks he does. He probably doesn't love you as much as he wants to commit to you, to commit to you. But he, but, but he loves me. Yeah, but he doesn't want to commit to you. He doesn't want you guys to become one. He wants to keep his own individual freedom. He doesn't want to be one with you. So I'm not sure if he really loves you as much as you think he does. And yet, girls, our sisters, we pour our hearts over to them. 
We give the one gift that no other gift can be given to them. Thinking that it's going to create something beautiful, but in the end what happens? It breaks you, and you're hurt by it. And it takes, and it takes a love like Christ to come and to renew that. It takes such a, a, a pursuing love like Christ to come and restore that in you. So brothers and sisters, this is my prayer. Brothers, if you're planning to engage in, in a relationship and marriage, engage in it with this full intent of marriage. Don't, if you like it, like Beyonce says, if you like it, put a ring on it, right? Engage in it. Don't just, play, don't just try it out. See, that's what guys do. We like to try things out. Not, I want to try it out, see if it works. Girls, when they're in a relationship, they're thinking, oh, this is prepar- I'm preparing for marriage. But guys are like, we're just going to try it out. I'm going to test the waters. If I like it, I'll stick to it. If I don't like it, I'll just back off, right? My prayer for you, brothers, is this, is that you will be sacrificial men who would give not just your, your heart, your attitude, but your whole being to this person, that you engage in a promise to this person, a covenant promise, and no matter what happens, I will be with you to the end. And ladies, same thing. I pray that you won't give your heart over to some any, any random guy, but to a dude that would take that and says, I will protect this to the ends of my age. All right? And you want that. Pursue better. Want more. Okay? Let's pray. You know, for a few of us, maybe, maybe the Lord is, um, is calling out maybe our attitudes. You know what? We, we've, we've grown up, you know, living with our moms so much that we've become so selfish. It's really all about us. You know, but we're, 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 we're young adult college. That's what our ministry is. And it's about time that we just grow up, become the women of God and the men of God that we were called to be. People who would give without fear, of ret- without, without thinking of the return. People who would offer their lives and their hearts freely, even if they're rejected. For some of us, maybe it's a prayer of just repentance of the selfish attitudes that we've lived. For some of us who are in relationship, maybe it's time to pray that I've been selfish in this relationship. I've been selfish with my boyfriend, my girlfriend, my wife, my husband. And it's time for me to really just live a life that's, that's more God-centered, that is more God-focused, that is more God-led, God-driven. For some of us, maybe we just need to understand Christ more. Maybe God has not really been that real um, strong figure in our hearts. We haven't been grasped by his love, captured by it, raptured by it, encircled by it yet. Maybe tonight and today, Jesus Christ is calling for your heart. And he says, let me love you in such a way so that you can love them. You can't love them by yourself. You will fail, but let me love you through that. Let's be raptured by that. Let's be captured by that. For some of us who are in relationship, who are intimately engaging in, in this intimacy, maybe it's time that we say, you know what? Maybe we need to hold off and wait and physically commit what our bodies have already spiritually created. For some guys, maybe that means, you know, you got to get your act together. Get a job. Know Jesus marry that gal, right? For some of you ladies, maybe it's time that you put down your walls if you're in your relationship and say, you know what? I trust this guy. Let me be vulnerable to him because he is being, he is promising this covenant relationship with me. Stability forever. Many times let go of these things, right? Let's come for the fall. Let's just talk to him. Let's engage in that. Let's just have a conversation and respond to the word and to what God has spoken to your heart about. And as we respond, let's continue to respond with, 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 uh, with, with praise. Let's respond with an offering. You know, as, if you're a guest here at, at TLC, you're not obligated to give. But if you are a member of TLC, I want you to give. Give sacrificially. Give not because... It's in your best interest, or it's, it's what's left over for you, but give because the heart of selfless attitude is being instilled into you. And let's respond with the song as we praise and we glorify God. Let me pray for you guys. Father, I want to thank you so much, Lord, for our church. God, I pray through this church that, that we will raise up godly men. Men, Father God, who will, who will love their wives, 
who will respect our sisters, men, Father God, who will take the word to the ends of the age, men, Father God, who will give selflessly, men who will, Father, reflect your son, Jesus Christ, sacrificially giving everything they have for the other person next to them. I pray, Father God, that you will raise such men here in this place. I pray, Father God, that you would continue to stir and convict them, Father God, to bring them up to a place, God, where they do not look for themselves, but they look towards the other. I pray, O oh Lord, that you continue to raise up godly women in this house, Lord. Women who love you more than they love their husbands. Women who, Father God, are entrenched by you, enraptured by you, captured by you more, Father God, than their husbands. So that, Lord, Father, love will flow from them when their husbands become selfish, when their boyfriends become selfish, when their relationship becomes selfish. Women, Father God, that will take your word cultivated in their heart, hold that promise, and wait, and wait, wait to give the most beautiful gift that you have ever given to us to someone who is willing to give their life for us as well, for them as well. So God, I pray for that. I pray for these ladies. I pray for these men. And I ask God that you will bring that to fruition in our days, in our age. We love you so much, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.